Good morning. I'm Sarah. Happy sourdough day. Um, so it's early in the morning. I'm a little sick. I'm short on time. I have a lot going on, um, but I'm also getting behind on bread. We've eaten it all up and I've got neighbors who like to buy it and everything else. So I'm going to mix up two batches of bread that will make, um, one of them I'm going to split into two 900 gram loaves and one of them I'll split into three 600 gram loaves. So when I bake later, I will have um, five loaves of bread. Um, so what I'm going to do during this live today is mix up two batches of the beginner bread recipe. And while I'm waiting for it to get ready to stretch and fold, I'm going to talk about starters, um, talk about some dehydrated starter. Um, so I actually have some and I've been experimenting a little bit with it um, and uh, just get through this. But I thought with all the new members who are in the group, with everything that's going on, just being able to see the process might be helpful. Um, in the description of this live, um, this video, I've posted a Linktree link, which brings you to the YouTube tutorials, the Facebook tutorials, um, lists of tools on Amazon, everything you could really ever need to uh, make sourdough bread. So first things first, the recipe for the beginner bread recipe is 120 grams of starter, 20 grams of salt, 680 grams of water, and 1,000 total grams of flour. I'm probably gonna use about 850 grams of all-purpose flour today and 150 grams of whole wheat flour for the total 1,000. Um, so here is my starter, and it had peaked last night. It's beyond peak. The ideal time would definitely be to use it while it's at peak. Um, however, if you're busy and you know it's well fed and it's a happy mature starter it's okay to use it after peak um, my second starter is a little closer to peak this is mama my main starter and this one's actually a starter that i have made from dehydrated starter so i'll talk about that after we get this mixed up so let's just mix the recipe so i just put my bowl on the scale and i tear it to zero so that the scale is ignoring the bowl and the first thing that I do is measure in 120 grams of starter. So I'm just going to stir my starter down and put in 120 grams. And I'm just going to set this aside and I'll feed it after I get the doughs mixed up. So I'm going to tear the scale to zero again. So now it's ignoring the bowl and the starter. And I'm going to add 680 grams of room temperature water. So I like to use a whisk and mix the starter and water together. It should get nice and foamy, nice sort of white, watery substance. Now I'm gonna stick my mix back on the scale. So I've got the 120 grams of starter and the 680 grams of water blended together. I'm going to tear my scale back to zero again. And now I'm going to add a total of 1,000 grams of flour. So I'm going to go with about 850 of regular all-purpose flour and then 150 grams of whole wheat. So I just dump it in. I try not to let the starter splash. I'm just going to top it off with the whole wheat flour. Okay. 
So I've got a thousand total grams of flour in here. Now I'm going to tear the scale back to zero one more time. And I'm going to add 20 grams of salt. Okay, so that's how simple the beginner bread recipe is. And while I'm waiting for stretch and folds and everything else, I'll talk about hydration, starters, you know, what we need to do. So the idea of the Sourdough for Beginners group that I started, which has 50,000 members now, it's really awesome, was that there are lots of complicated techniques out there for sourdough and there are lots of ways um, to do sourdough. And there's also a lot of stuff out there. But how can you simplify the process so that a beginner can do it with a limited amount of tools, you know, with very little experience. So as long as a, a beginner can get themselves to the point of having a strong starter, whether they make it themselves or they buy a dehydrated starter or somebody gifts it to them, then can they do this? And I think that the answer is yes. And so the way we have set up all of these videos um, in the tutorial section for the Sourdough for Beginners group has been with this focus of beginners. So. One of the first things is that this recipe is what we would call a low hydration recipe. Um, once you factor in the water and the starter, it works out to being only about 73% hydration. And a lower hydration recipe is easier to work with because it's not as sticky. Higher hydration recipes will give you a springier bread. They will give you, you know, a lighter bread. Um, there's definitely a place for them. There's things like baguettes that really benefit from very high hydration. But my philosophy is if you start with the beginner bread recipe with a low hydration recipe and master each of the steps, then you should be able to then sort of move along in your sourdough journey. So with my mixes, what I do is I just start to stir them up with a spoon and then I just use my hands to bring it all together. So during this first mix, all we're looking for is a shaggy dough and trying to sort of distribute the sour or the flour and water through the dough as much as we can. And once this is mixed, I'm going to set it aside and let it sit for about 30 minutes and then I'll begin the stretch and fold process. So here we go. So that's looking pretty good. So you can see it's quite sticky, it's quite shaggy. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let it sit now for 30 minutes. And during that 30 minutes, the, the starter's gonna start to activate the flour, the water's gonna soak into the flour more evenly. Okay, so I'm gonna set this one aside. I'm gonna rinse my hands and grab some more water and then I'll mix up a second batch. So like I said, my philosophy is keep it as simple as possible. I'm just using regular all-purpose flour, you know, inexpensive whole wheat flour, tap water. All of these things should work fine for your bread. There's obviously circumstances where they don't. I mean, if you don't have great water, you know, some countries have different flours, whatever it may be. But in most circumstances, when you're a beginner, you should be able to use basic ingredients. And the reality is that most of the issues that come up in sourdough are related to not doing the process properly, less than they're related to whether or not your kitchen is warm enough or whether or not you're using the right flowers or the right techniques or whether you have a lid on your starter or you don't. Um, you're, it's more likely that the issues that you're having with your sourdough are because you're using a recipe that's too high in hydration. 
you're not cold um, bulk proofing effectively. You're either bulk proofing not long enough or too long. Um, you're not pre-shaping and shaping well. And so what I've done is tried to set up these tutorials that keep it as simple as possible and we just practice and practice the steps. So this is my main starter, Mama. She's a little after peak, but not far. I always stir my starters down a little before I use them. Mama likes to stay nice and thick. She always is. So I'm just going to tear my scale to zero with the bowl on it. And I'm going to scoop 120 grams of starter in. Now, one of the most common we, questions we always see about starters in the group is, oh, my starter's really thick, or oh, my starter's really thin. They're both normal, and as long as the starter is active and alive, it will work. So I wouldn't focus too much on textures or smells or anything else. So I've got these two starters that I've used for the recipes. I'm going to feed them after I get the two mixes made. So now I'm going to add 680 grams of just room temperature tap water. And I'm going to use my whisk and mix them together. Mama, my main starter, she's a little thicker, so I'll have to sort of mix it a little more. You can kind of see the starter sort of goopy and floating around in there. But I just keep mixing until it makes sort of a thick, watery mix. So again, back on the scale, and I'm going to tear the scale back to zero. So I've got the 100 and 120 grams of starter, 680 grams of water. Now I'm going to add 1,000 total grams of flour. I'm going to go with about 800 grams of regular all-purpose flour, and then I'm going to add, you know, 200 or so grams of whole wheat. The blend of flours that you use doesn't matter as much. Later, when you get more experienced and everything else, you'll start to realize that certain flowers absorb water faster, certain flowers rise faster, whatever it may be. But ultimately, um, at, at the beginning, what you're trying to do is practice the process. So I was just talking away and ended up with 935 grams of, of all-purpose, so that's fine. I'm just going to top it up to 1,000 with the whole wheat. And then again, I'm just going to tear the scale back to zero one more time and add 20 grams of salt. Okay, so once I've got my mix ready, I sort of always just blend the two flours and the salt on top for a second. And then I start to mix it together with the spoon. I use the spoon until enough flour and water have been absorbed that it sort of turns into a ball and you can't really mix it with the spoon anymore. And then I switch to my hands. So I'm in a hurry today. Um, my daughter has to leave for school. Um, it's 8.38 a.m. right now, and I think that my daughter has to leave for school by 10.15, so 9.30, so I don't quite have two hours for stretch and folding, um, and I definitely don't have time to be here while my bread bulk proofs. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to speed up the stretch and folds a little bit. I'll probably do them every 15 or 20 minutes instead of every 30 minutes. And then I'm going to get these doughs into my bulk proofing containers and I'm actually going to stick them straight in the fridge. 
So they will start to rise in the fridge a little bit, but it'll be much, much slower. And then when I'm home and I've got a few hours, I'll pull the doughs out on the counter. I'll let them finish bulb proofing on the counter and then I will shape and pre-shape. And some of the bread I will bake right away and some of it I'll put in the fridge to cold proof overnight. So when I do a morning like this where I mix up two batches and end up with somewhere between four and six loaves, depending on how I split them, I actually end up with enough dough to bake over a couple of days. And this has been working really well for me um, because we've just been extra busy lately. There's been some extra things in our lives that are taking me away and making it so that I have to focus on what it is that I need to do. So as you can see, the dough is starting to come together. It's very sticky, right? It's very shaggy. This is normal. So one of the things I see in the group all the time is, oh my gosh, my dough is so sticky or oh it's so stiff I couldn't get it to mix the reason that we stretch and fold in sourdough is because it it's just got so much hydration and the sticky starter in it that you really can't knead it traditionally like you would with bread and so the stretching and folding process is a much gentler process that allows us to get the strength that we need into the dough um, without it sticking to absolutely everything so I've got this second dough mixed up. I'm just gonna set it aside with the other one. Rinse my hands and grab some water, and then I'm gonna um, refeed my starters and talk a little bit about those. So just bear with me. Okay, so I've got, I'm going to do my first stretch and fold for those two mixes after about 15 minutes. Usually I would wait 30 minutes and then I would do four stretch and folds every 30 minutes after that. So the whole process from beginning to end is nearly three hours, but I don't have that time today. So instead I'm going to stretch and fold every 10 or 15 minutes until I see that strength that I need and get, um, get these doughs separated. So I'll stick around until the first stretch and fold so I can show you. And I'll talk a little bit about starters and refeed these while we're at it. All right, so which starter is this? Okay, so the other day I took some of my starter and I spread it out on parchment paper and put it inside my oven with the light on and dehydrated it. It took about three days for it to fully get dry, but now I've got these like flaky, you know, the, the, the consistency that I could think of the most that this dehydrated starter reminds me of is pasta. But I wanted to see how this was gonna work. The dehydrated starter smells very strong. It smells a lot like sourdough starter. Um, so then what I did was I took 10 grams of this starter I put 20 grams of water on top of it in this container and I left it sitting for about 24 hours. In that 24 hours, that little tiny bit of water dissolved the starter. After 24 hours, I added 75 grams each of water and flour, mixed that all together. So now I had a total of 180 grams, 10 grams of dehydrated starter, 20 grams of water and 75 grams each of flour and water. <coughs> Excuse me. And I let that sit for 24 hours. And so now that was day two. Then on day three, I discarded 120 grams, fed 60 grams each of, of flour and water, and this thing woke right up. So I think with the dehydrated starter, it's reasonable to say that within 72 hours, you could be using it. So if you're buying dehydrated starters off of Amazon or Etsy, or there's some people in the group um, who sell it, then you should expect it to take about three days for your starter to be ready. Now, in regards to ratio, I feed my starters on a one to one to one ratio, and I use a 60 gram base. The beginner sourdough recipe calls for 120 grams of starter. So using this 60 gram one to one to one base makes it so that when I discard, it's 120 grams, which is perfect for the recipe. So I never have to discard any of my starter into a jar unless I haven't been baking and it needs to be fed. 
Um, but in most cases, I can just discard straight out of my starter into my bread recipe and then refeed. So I've gotten comments on this before. When I refeed my starter, I leave the knife sitting in there. I don't know why. I just, I don't think I want the mess on my counter. I sort of keep like a little plate going for the tools that I'm using. I'm a little bit OCD with cleanliness, but I just put the container and the knife on the scale and then I turn the scale on. And what the scale does is it ignores what's on there and comes in at zero. So anyways, I've done lives and videos before and people have commented and said, why is your knife in there? I don't know. It's just something that I do, but I know the scale's at zero. So in my mind, it doesn't really matter. So I'm going to feed 60 grams of flour. And then I'm going, going to zero again and feed 60 grams of water. Now, if you're doing your starter using cups, um, water is approximately twice as heavy as flour. So the most common way to do it is half a cup of flour and a quarter cup of water. Um, but if you only buy one tool when it comes to sourdough, get a, a scale. This is just like an Amazon basic scale. I posted links for it all over the group. Um, there's links to the Amazon idea list through the link tree link that I put in the description of this live. Um, it's like $12 in any currency, depending on when you buy it, they go on sale sometimes. And honestly, it's the one thing that I feel like if you need anything with sourdough, that's what you need. You can do sourdough with cups and measures. I mean, the pioneers used to do it with nothing, right? But the pioneers also had, you know, everyone around them did it and knew how to did it and do it. And they didn't have to figure out the process all by themselves. So if you'd like to make your life easier, then definitely use the scale. So I've read, refed this starter. Um, I am firmly and deeply in the sealed lid camp. Um, there are tutorials and advice out there that say that when you're making a starter, you should leave the lid loose, you should use a fabric lid, you should let it breathe. Um, and that I guess that could be true. One of the things they say is that your starter needs yeast from the air. I wholeheartedly do not believe that. Um, when you understand what a starter is doing, I think you'll agree. You're taking flour and water and you're fermenting it, right? Fermenting is the process of the, the flour breaking down the water and eventually it starts to create alcohols and bacterias and everything else. I think that the starter itself creates everything that it needs. I don't think it needs yeast from the air. Um, and every time, 100% of the time I've seen someone say, oh my gosh, my starter got mold or my starter's got crusties on top. Um, it always comes down to they're not using a sealed lid. Um, also, starters, um, fruit flies are att attracted to fermenting food. Um, and so that open lid is going to attract fruit flies into your home and nobody wants that. Um, so I keep my starters sealed. These are just deli containers. Um, there's a lady in my neighborhood who makes pickles. I just save the jars when we're done eating them and and use them. I actually ordered a 24 pack of these off of Amazon because I'm planning to give a bunch of starters away for Christmas. But, um, all right. So this is mama. This is my main starter. My first one I ever made. She's thick and strong. So I'm going to refeed her as well. Okay. 60 grams of flour. And then I'll just tear back to zero and 60 grams of water. So a conversation that often comes up about starter is consistency. People say um, you should mix your starter to um, pancake batter consistency. The reality is that as long as once your starter is established, as long as it is doubling, 
and working, your consistency doesn't necessarily matter. That's reality number one. Reality number two is that your consistency of your starter changes as it goes through the fermentation process, right? So I'm just going to show you mama. She's thick. Like, I don't know if you would call that pancake batter, but I like super thin pancakes. But when I mix her, she's thick. And by morning, when I use her, or this afternoon, four to six hours at peak, presumably, she'll have thinned out a little, but she's just a thick starter. Just is what it is. And then I've got other starters. I'm going to pull one out of the fridge and show you right now that just stay watery. And the reality is that they all work just as well. So this other starter that I mixed, you can see that the consistency of this one is a little thinner than Mama. It moves on its own. And then I'm going to show you one more. So this starter was fed about five days ago and put in the fridge. As you can see, it has peaked and fallen. Um, I wouldn't use this starter. It needs to be fed. Um, so, you know, four to six hours before I bake, but I want you to see inside. So if you look, it's got a tiny bit of hooch on top, a little bit of gray, and I don't want it to spill, but it's very, very watery right? So this consistency conversation isn't necessarily valid. If your starter's working, that's all that really matters. Okay, so like I said, I'm in a bit of a hurry today. I'll be honest, I'm in a bit of a hurry most days, but in particular today, um, I've got to be out the door by a certain time. So what are the most important things in sourdough? If you need to adjust your time or if you're trying to figure out your time, if you acknowledge what the most important things are in sourdough, then you can figure out how to work around these things, okay? So the most important first step is that your starter is active and ready to use. Um, if you're making your starter from scratch, if your starter is at least seven days old and is doubling consistently within four to six hours of every single feed, it is ready and ready to use. Starters only get better over time. Um, so those first few batches, there is a good chance that your problems that you encounter are because of your starter. Um, but there's other steps that really matter too. The second thing that matters is the hydration level of your recipe. A higher hydration recipe is stickier and more difficult to work with. Um, so as a beginner, if you can start with a lower hydration recipe, you're going to do yourself a favor. The next thing is to build strength. Um, and I'm just going to quickly discuss how we know when we've built enough strength. But when you build good strength in your bread, it allows it to bulk proof well. Excuse me. <coughs> After that, bulk proofing is important. There's a lot of recipes out there that say to leave your dough to bulk proof on the counter overnight. And when you're experienced, absolutely do that. The reality is that most of these doughs only take somewhere between four and 10 hours to, um, to bulk proof. And I do not recommend doing bulk proofs as a beginner unless you can actually watch them. Um, so when I, I'm going to show you my bulk proofing containers, but what I recommend is that, you know, you your starters working, you know the beginner bread recipe, you've mastered building strength, now you've got to perfect bulk proofing. You should really use clear straight sided containers, push your dough down into it, mark its height, and make sure that you're around to be there to watch your dough grow and catch it right at that point. Um, some recipes call for anything between a 50 and 100% rise. The safest thing you can do as a beginner is grab your dough at around a 75 or 80 percent rise and try a bake. If it looks over or underproofed, try rising it a little more. Try rising it a little less. But no matter what with, starter, with sourdough, you have to practice. After that, after the bulk proofing is mastered, then um, pre-shaping is an important step because it starts to build some tension in the dough. The dough after bulk proofing is going to be very sticky. And when you pre-shape, touching the dough as little as you can with your hands, using a knife or a bench scraper, 
you're going to sort of train the dough that you are going to shape it, but it also builds kind of a skin on top and takes some of that stickiness away. And then finally, when you're shaping, you're using lots of flour. So one of the things that we hear all the time is, it's sticky, what do I do, right? It's supposed to be sticky, and there's ways to manage it through its stickiness. It's whether or not it's the right kind of sticky. So for me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rush my stretch and folds. I'm going to do them every 10 or 15 minutes or so until I get four or five in, until I see the strength that I need. Um, with my experience, I know how. And then I'm going to get this dough into my bulk proofing containers and I'm going to stick them in the fridge um, so that they don't bulk proof while I'm gone today because I'm probably going to be gone most of the day. When I get back, they will have proofed a little bit in the fridge, but I'll be able to pull them out of the fridge and watch them until they're at that right bulk proofing level. I'll probably do another live at that point and go over shaping and pre-shaping. So it's 8.54. I mixed, the second dough was done at 8.38. This one would have been done at about 8.33. So it's been about 20 minutes. So I'm going to do a stretch and fold. So I'm just going to get my hand wet. I usually always try to, I don't keep it soaked, but I just get it damp and I try to get my palm wet. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to scoop under my dough. And if you watch, this is our first stretch and fold, right? The dough is going to rip. I'm just going to fold it over. So now I'm going to work my way all the way around the dough. And I like to sort of give it a shake and encourage it to stretch. And as you're doing your stretch and folding, you'll notice it starts to come up way less. But that first stretch, it came up a lot, right? And the other thing is with your first stretch, you'll notice that if you grab the dough and hold it, it'll start to come apart. The way you know that you've built enough strength in your dough is when that stops happening. I mean, you'll always be able to rip your dough if you're, being, if you're using your muscles, right? But if you're being gentle, then... After the third or fourth stretch and fold, you'll see it start to hold together. So even after the first stretch and fold, it's still shaggy and lumpy, but it's a lot smoother than it was. So this one hasn't been stretched and folded yet. And you can see it's quite bumpy, lumpy, shaggy. Whereas this one has had a quick stretch and fold and it's a lot smoother. It's a lot more like a ball. So I'll just take my hands and I'll sort of work around this and if you watch I can actually already begin to coax it into a ball see it's starting to move together with itself pulling away from the edges of the bowl all right so let's stretch and fold this one so same thing I'll just show you so I'm going to go under I can see there's dry spots there's wet spots it's messy it feels very sticky. It's getting all over my hands. This is all normal. So I'm just gonna go around. With my first stretch and fold, I don't, I don't usually only do north, south, west, east. I usually just keep making my way around. You'll notice that by the fifth or sixth stretch and fold, it's not even really stretching anymore. It's coming out together. But with that first stretch and fold, because I'm a lazy mixer, <laughs> I like to just build it up that little bit of strength. Okay, let me just rinse my hands. So if you've mixed your dough properly with 120 grams of starter, 680 grams of water, 1,000 grams of flour, and 20 grams of salt, then when all is said and done, you should have 1,800-ish grams of dough, give or take 5 or 10 grams. So what I do with these doughs is I either split them into two 900-gram loaves um, or three 600 gram loaves. The 600 gram loaves I just cook in little loaf pans and the 900 grams I cook in bigger loaf pans or I'll open bake them on a stone or cook them in a Dutch oven, whatever I feel like. Um, now, I did mention that in the 
description of this live video, I've put a link tree link and it takes you to all of, it's a gateway to all of the tutorials that we've created. Um, but in that link, I put sort of the most important ones. Um, something that's, that's endlessly important in sourdough is proofing. If you underproof your bread, it will be dense um, and gummy. If you overproof your bread, it will just fall and be, you know, sort of a, a frisbee disc block. Um, and so the trick that I use to make sure that I'm bulking properly, you can actually see some of the remnants of my last dough on this, is that once I've built enough strength into the dough, then I take my dough, separate it into these containers. I, I use the back of my fist wet. I push it down as much as I can into here. And then I mark the height of my dough. And then I just watch for it to rise. And when it first goes in, there's always sort of voids because you can't really force the dough to just sit flat. It's too too um, elastic of a dough. So there's kind of like spots here where it's not touching the edge. You can kind of see my lines like here, the dough only sat here and this, it wasn't touching on the edges here. So later when I look at my dough, it will have expanded outwards to the edge of the container and also upwards and start to have that dome. And then I know it's ready to reshape. So just to summarize, um, what I'm going to do over the next hour here, because I have to leave at 1030 and I need to, a time to clean up and get ready, is every 20 minutes or so for the next hour, I'm going to stretch and fold this dough. By the fourth stretch and fold, all of the shagginess in this dough will have gone away. It'll start to look shiny and I'll be able to do what's called a window pane effect. So I'm gonna show you a failed window pane effect right now. So we'll get our hands nice and wet. So this is a window pane fail. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the dough to stretch until it goes translucent. But as you can see, this dough does not have enough strength so it won't work. So after three and four, three or four stretch and folds, I'll try that again right? See how it's starting to get thin and translucent here, but it just rips. When the dough's got good strength, when you do that, when you stretch up your dough, and I'm not talking a huge amount, but when you gently stretch up your dough and use your fingers to sort of rub it, it starts to stretch. You can look through it, hence the window pane, and it doesn't rip easily. Of course it will rip if you push it, but what I'm saying is what it doesn't rip easy. So the summary is this, I'm going to work this dough until it builds strength. I'm going to separate it into proofing containers and then I'm going to stick it in the fridge and forget about it probably until late tonight, possibly until tomorrow morning. It will start to proof in the pr fridge, but it won't fully proof in the fridge. Um, and so when I am ready, to focus on my dough again, I'll pull it out of the fridge and I'll let it finish bulk proofing. And then I'll move on to pre-shaping and shaping and baking. And I'm thinking with this batch, if I can, I'll pop back on live again and show you the proof dough and get it ready. Okay guys, I hope you enjoy your day. Um, I'm always here to help. I try to comment on everybody's posts in the group, but there's 50,000 people and Facebook keeps blocking me. Facebook keeps telling me that I've commented too many times and blocking me from commenting till later in the month. So it's just not possible anymore. Um, but definitely look for these tutorials, practice them as a beginner, and then start to work yourself up to the more complicated recipes. And if you've ever got any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Talk to you soon.